Hello again, everybody. Welcome back to the For Love of the Game podcast. We're doing another edition of Card Talk. I'm joined uh, by my father, Tom Tunison. He's the resident statistician. He is uh, on the board for the New York State Baseball Hall of Fame and also the vice chair for the Thurman Munson Hall of Fame committee. Uh, thanks for joining us today, Hey, Pops. it's great to be here. This is awesome. So uh, today we're going to talk about a, a guy who uh, was recently inducted into the uh, Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, Mr. Minnie Minoso. This and, guy right here. And uh, it, it's funny because, you know, I, when he was inducted, I was seeing a lot of people posted online like, who, who is this guy? You know, who's Minnie Minoso? Why does he deserve to, to be in the Hall of Fame? So, uh, Pops, tell, tell the viewers, you know, who is Minnie Minoso? Minnie is um, the first black Latino superstar in baseball history. He was born and raised in Cuba in the 1920s. Uh, he grew up just loving the game of baseball. He wanted to play baseball. He, uh, he watched greats before him from the island of Cuba and just was fascinated with baseball, like all of us are. And um, he was a terrific player. He got the opportunity to um, play some, if you would, semi-pro ball in Cuba and um, started making a name for himself over there and ultimately made it here to the States. So he, he immigrated over here to the States. And, and where did he get his start playing uh, professionally here in America? Many got his start with the, um, in the Negro Leagues with the New York Cubans. And he played for them in 1946 and 1947 and helped them win the championship in 1947. He caught the eye of the Cleveland Indians. And the Indians signed him in 1948. And the Indians were pretty um, stacked. They had some really good talent. They had Larry Doby. They had Luke Easter. A um, couple of other really good players that kind of blocked Minnie's path a little bit. So they sent him to San Diego, down to the minor leagues, and he absolutely tore it up. For two years in San Diego, he just was on fire. Um, drove in a lot of runs, hit many homers. Uh, was just doing his thing. He was he was really honing his craft. Now he already had played for years in Cuba. He had already you know made a name for himself there. Came over here, was a sensational All Star Negro League player, champion, and now he's you know just destroying the pitching down in uh, in in Triple A with the San Diego team out there for the Indians, and probably could have been playing in the major leagues then. I mean, so he spent some time, valuable time down there when he could have already been up in the major leagues. Right. And so, as you said, he would eventually join the White Sox. That's where he spent most of his career. And can we go through, you know, uh, some of the stats that, that you've uh, compiled here and, and really tell us, tell us the story. Why does he belong with some of the greats in the, in the game, including you know, Mickey Mantle and Ted Williams? So everybody knows Ted Williams, everybody knows Mickey Mantle, but what everybody doesn't know is that in 1954, in the American League, on base percentage, the top three batters were Ted Williams, Minnie Minoso, and Mickey Mantle. In slugging, the top three batters were Ted Williams, Minnie Minoso, and Mickey Mantle. On base plus slugging, the top three batters were Ted Williams, Minnie Minoso, and Mickey Mantle. Uh, OPS plus, that is park adjusted. Ted Williams, Mickey Mantle, and Minnie Minoso were one, two, three. You know, you're talking about two of the absolute greatest players of all time in Ted Williams and Mickey Mantle. And there's many battling with them for the top spots in these very difficult offensive categories. Um, Minnie's right there with them. Fast forward two years later, Mickey Mantle wins the Triple Crown. Man, it was amazing. Uh, offensive war, which is a new Sabre metric statistic. Uh, Mickey Mantle was number one. Ted Williams, number two. Minnie Minoso, number three. On base plus slugging. Mickey Mantle, number one. Ted Williams, number two. Minnie Minoso, number three. Um, 
extra base hits. Mantle was number one. Minnie was number three, tied with Yogi Berra. Runs scored, Mantle was number one. Minnie was number three. Fast forward to 1957. Walks. Mickey Mantle, number one. Ted Williams, number two. Minnie Minoso, number three. There's no other player that can finish or can say they finished one, two, three with Ted Williams and Mickey Mantle like Minnie Minoso can in the 50s. That's pretty impressive. That's not a very good player. That's a great player. That's a Hall of Fame player. So that really is some impressive company. Um, how does he stack up? I know you did uh, the, the guys, you know, his competition, who he played against. But what about some other uh, Hall of Famers? I like to look at top five, you know, for impact. You know, if you, you can't always finish first and even second. You have so many great players in the league. So I like to look at for a career, how many times did you finish in the top five? For instance, many finished in the top five in all the offensive categories. If you take like runs, runs batted in, hits, batting average, on base percentage, extra base hits, all those important offensive categories, Many had 92 top five finishes. Wow. So 92 times he finished top five. Um, take a guy like, let's say, Vladimir Guerrero, as great as he was, Hall of Fame of Vladimir Guerrero, 67 top five finishes. Chipper Jones, Hall of Famer Chipper Jones, 43 top five finishes. Tim Raines, Hall of Famer Tim Raines, 56 top five finishes. Um, Ken Griffey Jr., 73 top five finishes. Now, we're not saying that Minnie was Ken Griffey Jr. Minnie was Minnie, but Minnie had 92 top five finishes. He had over 160 top 10 finishes. Okay, take uh, Andre Dawson, Hall of Famer, 59 top five finishes. Um, Jim Rice, Hall of Famer, 59 top, type, top five finishes. Um, Cal Ripken Jr., 49 top five finishes. So that just gives you an idea of how good he was. I mean, it's tremendous. Kirby Pocket Hall of Famer, 51 top five finishes. Um, Jim Tomey, 60 top five finishes. Paul Molitor, 49 top five finishes. Tony Perez, 26 top five finishes. Barry Larkin, 20 top five finishes. Alan Trammell, 22 top five finishes. Back to many, 92 top five finishes. 22 times led the league in different offensive categories. That ranks better than most of the guys that I just named along with many. Um, they don't have that many times leading the league in, in offensive categories. Many was, he was sensational. He made the go-go White Sox go. And in talking about those White Sox teams, I mean, he, Minnie himself played with other Hall of Famers. You know, you had Luis Aparicio, Nellie Fox, I believe, was on the team. Some Nelly, other great players. Yep, Larry Doby at times Larry was Doby. played with him. How does he stack up, you know, with, with his teammates? Uh, he, was, he was a leader, man. He, he led them in um, what we call clutch statistics, clutch hitting. In 1951, his rookie year. When the team trailed, he led them in on-base plus slugging. When the game was tied, he led them in runs batted in and on-base plus slugging. 1952, with two outs and runners in scoring position. It wasn't a great year for many in 52, but with two outs and runners in scoring position, he led the White Sox in on-base plus slugging for the second year in a row. When the game was late and close, many led them in RBIs. 53, he picked it up a notch. Two outs and runners in scoring position. He led the team in runs batted in. Total bases, on base plus slugging. When the game was late and close, he led the team in average, on base plus slugging. When the game was tied, he led the White Sox in hits. Total bases, on base plus slugging. In 1954, arguably his best year, he led the, he led the league in war. He led, he led the team in... Runs batted in, total bases, average, on base plus slugging. That was all when the team was behind. Late and close, he led the team in hits. Runs batted in, total bases, average, on base plus slugging. When the game was tied, he led the team in runs batted in, total bases, on base plus slugging. 
Fast forward two years, 1956, when the team trailed, he led them in total bases. With two outs and runners in scoring position, he led the team in on-base plus slugging. When it was late and close, he led the team in total bases, on-base plus slugging. When the game was tied, he led them in on-base plus slugging. Same thing in 1957. In 1958, he gets traded to Cleveland. He leads when the team is behind. He leads the team in hits. When there's two outs and runners in scoring position, he leads the team in hits, runs batted in, total bases. When the game is tied, he leads the team in hits and total bases. In 1959, his second year back with Cleveland, with two outs and runners in scoring position, it was Minnie Minoso. Runs batted in, total bases, on base plus slugging. He goes back to the White Sox in 1960. He leads the league in hits. When the team was behind, he led the team in hits, total bases, and batting average. Two outs and runners in scoring position. He led the team in runs batted in and total bases. When it was late and close, he led the team in hits and batting average. Wow. So those really are some clutch statistics. And uh, I don't think there should be any debate whether many should be a Hall of Famer or not. And uh, if, if folks want to learn more, uh, you know, about this great player, this great person, uh, what are some resources that, that you found that, that folks can also look up? Well, it's something I really love. I've had my eye on it for a while, and I was just fortunate enough to get it as a gift for Christmas from my son, Dan, your brother. And it's right here, this Sport Magazine, 1954 edition with Minnie Gracing a cover. This is an awesome magazine, and it's right in the heart of his career. Um, and here is Ted Williams. There you go again, Ted Williams with Minnie Minoso. And another great, probably the best resource that I found was this book right here, Minnie's book right here. This tells it all. It tells um, his childhood in Cuba, how he got here. It gives you all the details. And it's a tremendous story of, to me, courage. Um, and he escaped Cuba, communist Cuba. They took just about everything he had. And he came to America and had to deal with the racial tension in America. Yet he still kept that beautiful disposition, wonderful, loving person. Everybody that I see, I didn't know many, of course, but everybody that I see and watch with interviews, what a joyful, wonderful man this guy was. And uh, he's a treasure. He's a treasure to us, uh, not only as in baseball, but as a humanitarian as a wonderful guy who spread joy. And that's what it's all about, man. So now my favorite part of the show, we're gonna talk some baseball cards. Dad, what are you holding up there? Here I am holding the 52 Bauman Mini Minoso rookie card, which probably is, it might be the first card I ever saw of Mini, and it's my favorite. This card is really underrated. It it gives you everything you can want. Look at the, look at the artwork there. Minnie's in his swing, and it's just a great, great picture. Um, like I said, underrated card. Here's a near mint, mint eight, and it's a beauty. I love this one. And next is one of my favorites from the famed 52 Tops set, his 52 Tops rookie. Uh, that's a 4.5 there, really nice centering. And you can see the size difference of the Tops. Tops went a little large as compared to, to the Bowman, um, but... Both great cards, great centering, and just part of two really iconic sets in the card industry. And Bauman really put out some awesome cards uh, for Minnie in his first couple of years. This is the 53 and 54 Bauman. I don't know, there, there's just something, I don't know which one I like the best. I love his huge glove in, in the 54, but I mean, that shot of him in the 53 is just so crisp. Uh, and Dad, what, what draws you to these cards? It's really something when you when you go through baseball cards and a lot of them, a lot of the shots just they're not very good. You know, it's really interesting to me that many got three really great cards. Bauman did a, a terrific job in 52, 53 and 54. These are great images. They did a terrific job here. I can't say it enough. It's it's really awesome. And now for the cream of the crop, a card that I never knew existed until uh, you found it, but what, what are you holding there? Well, I stumbled upon this. Um, I was reading an article by somebody, and they actually called it their holy grail of Mini Minoso cards. This is from Cuba. This is a Caramello Deportivo Arrestus Minoso. 
card number 27 from the 1945-1946 set. And um, it's extremely hard to find. And it's hard to find in really great condition. I believe that there are only two that are graded higher than a two. Uh, one is a four, a PSA four, and I believe a PSA six. Really rare card. Great shot of mini. Um, it's unbelievable. Look how young he is there. He has some fabulous cards in this hobby. And, uh, and this is a beauty. If you can get your hands on one of these, uh, you've got yourself a great piece of history. Baseball history, Mini Minoso history. So that wraps up today's video. Uh, Dad, thanks for putting all those awesome stats together. Hopefully you guys watch and learn, learn something new today about Mini and, and exactly why he deserves to be enshrined in Cooperstown. Thanks for having me, Jim. It was a pleasure. Um, this really means a lot to me. It's great to be here. Thank you.